Welcome to the South Florida AGC second Wednesday safety session. Today is June 8th, 2022. Uh, I've got all eyes on me, man. I love this. Making me a little nervous there, Dan. So great audience here hanging out with us today. Thank you very much to those of you who came out to the offices of Styles Construction in beautiful downtown Fort Lauderdale. As always, I want to thank off by starting the people who allow us to give you this uh, wonderful presentation each and every month. Um, I wanna start off by thanking Cedric over at the offices of Kelly Cronenberg. He uh, double checks our tech, make sure the audio and video is working. Thank you very much, Cedric. Um, I wanna thank also um, the team at SafeRight Solutions for always taking care of breakfast. Thank you to the team at SafeRight. Um, and also I wanna recognize our uh, title sponsor each and every month who allows us to bring these uh, this wonderful information to you each month. The team from Milwaukee, uh, presenting today from Milwaukee is the great Roger Flores. So Roger, if you give me one second to walk back up to my computer, I'm gonna switch things around and I'll put you on the big screen. But you can go ahead and get started. Hey, good morning guys. Thanks for having me here today. For those that don't know me, my name is Roger Flores. I'm the territory manager uh, down here in South Florida. I cover, um, for Porsche and Nosey all the way down to the Keys. Uh, as Carlos mentioned, you know, we're the sponsor for this uh, safety sessions. And uh, Milwaukee, big goal right now is to, you know, is to try to help everybody on the field by being safe. With that said, I'm, I'm gonna be very quick right now. And I'm gonna show you something guys that you're gonna get at the end of this presentation. Uh, at, the, at the end of this presentation, all the PPE solutions that Milwaukee is coming out with um, something that is becoming a trend or it's, uh, you know, very popular right now is that type two helmet or oh, for those, you know, for those of you guys in the field, uh, better known as climbing helmet, uh, Milwaukee right now has eight of those colors, uh, more, you know, in the future, um, the, the type, the type one helmet as well, type one helmet as well, type one hard head as well. Um, something very important as well is like we're coming up with a lot of different um, accessories. We're, we're going to be able to attach like up to seven or eight of, the, of those. Um, the vest, the customization right now, we have it in-house. Um, we're able to have the logo and and everything you guys need on, on your vest. We have the, you know, eight pockets, 15 pockets and the different glasses, the old kinds of eye protection, performance glasses, tinted glasses, um, indoor, outdoors, um, ear protection, mask, and, you know, something very, very cool that we came out with um, the last the last year with the, was the first aid kits. A lot, of, a lot of solutions, a lot of new innovations to all the products that Milwaukee's coming out with. Again, you guys are going to have, you guys are going to have, um, a copy of this document, you know, in your email shortly. And, uh, and again, you know, if you, if you guys have any questions, any, any concerns, um, don't hesitate, um, please, you know, reach out and, and we can try to find a solution for you guys. Other than that, Carlos, thank you so much. All right, Roger, thank you very much. We appreciate you coming on and we appreciate your support. Uh, great segue for you all. Uh, funny enough, our title sponsor of our fishing tournament this year is going to be Milwaukee. Uh, we're going to be having our fishing tournament July 22nd through the 24th. It's going to be absolutely amazing. We're going to be at the Mar we're going to be in Marathon in the Keys. Uh, we're going to be at Fado Blanco Resort, which is right there on a marina. Um, going to be a great time. Going to have a Friday captain's party. Um, Lots of drinks, lots of flowing alcohol. Next day, going to be fishing, going to have a great weigh-in party, going to have an incredible dinner and awards party. And then the next day, we're going to close everything off with a nice brunch, send everybody off in style. If you're interested on more information on our fishing tournament, you can reach out to our team, to myself or Vanessa, or you can go to sfagc.org and get more information there. Just click on the events tab and go to July, and you'll see information there on the fishing tournament. That being said, let's get to the reason we're here today. Um, I have the, uh, it's unfortunate, the premise of tonight's, of today's presentation. It's everyone's worst nightmare having a fatality on their job site. 
And today what we're gonna be doing is gonna be reviewing fatalities and how to present them from happening, pre prevent them from happening in the first place. Um, our review to the pervasive problem is gonna be in quick overview of, uh, a quick overview of some basic concepts that Deborah Hampton will be presenting. Um, according to OSHA, 5,333 workers died on the job in 2019. Um, that's 3.5 per 100,000 100, full-time workers. That's more than 100 a week or about 15 deaths every day. About 20% of worker fatalities in private industry in 2019 were in construction. And that accounts for one in five worker deaths for the year. According to NIOSH, falls remain the leading cause of worker fatalities. Um, they account for more than one in three of the total number of fatalities in the industry. Today, we're joined by two safety professionals. Uh, someone I heard about for quite some time and I'm really happy to meet him. Very cool to find out that we had a similar start in uh, here in the association world in South Florida is Larry Lyman. Uh, Larry is the principal at Safety Consulting and Training Inc. Very cool, family run company. I love that he puts that right there on his materials. Um, he has over 20 years of experience in the construction industry and has worked with many, many of our members uh, who have nothing but great things to say about him. Um, we're grateful to have him here with us today. And I'm gonna get out of the way so you can take your seat, sir. I know I'm, I'm blocking your, your seat. So also joining us is Deborah Hampton. Debbie is the risk and safety director at Current Builders. Like Larry, Debbie has over two decades of industry experience and has worked on almost every type of construction project imaginable. More importantly, Debbie is chair of our safety committee and she is president of the South Florida AGC. She will be taking that helm in 2024. Debbie and Larry, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlos. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, so today what we're gonna talk about is a very sobering topic as Carlos indicated. And unfortunately construction uh, basically leads all other industries in terms of the fatalities. So what we're going to talk about today and what our takeaways are going to be for everybody who is there live and who's participating via Zoom is what we can do as safety professionals and what we can do period as construction industry professionals to help prevent fatalities from occurring on our job sites. So we're gonna talk a little bit about leading indicators and we're going to discuss how we can use them. Um, then we're going to segue into a discussion um, where Larry's going to review one of his fatalities and basically the lessons learned from that and how we can go backwards to try to prevent these fatalities from occurring on our sites. So first of all, just as a, as a very brief premise, um, what is a safety leading indicator? Because many folks don't even know what that really is. Safety leading indicators are proactive measures um, as opposed to um, something that would be a lagging indicator. Once an injury has occurred, that's considered already a lagging indicator. Those are statistics. So the um, proactive measures definitely can help prevent um, any type of serious injuries and even all injuries, but uh, focusing on fatalities from occurring. So lagging indicators basically tell you in retrospect that you had a failure in, in your safety and health program, um, but they can't really tell you what led up to it in the first place unless you get involved in, in some root cause, but by then the incident has already occurred. So root causes um, and the root cause specifically of near miss incidents are what really can help prevent you from having a fatality on your site. So you can measure like how many root causes you're doing and then act on those root causes of near misses that are getting reported to either the construction folks on your site or the safety folks on your site. Um, other types of leading indicators that you can use um, are behavior-based safety observations, which is something that we're very active with at current builders. Um, we can also track attend a training attendance. That's something else that we also do at Current Builders amongst uh, tracking the near misses and doing root causes on near misses. So what is a near miss? It's quite simply, a near miss is a potential hazard or incident 
in which no personal injury was actually sustained, but where given a slight shift in time or position, somebody could have easily been hurt. Um, so a lot of times you'll hear to near misses referred to as the close calls or near accidents or injury free events. The problem is with near misses is by definition, they don't have an injury associated with them. They have not incurred any type of property damage and they leave no evidence that anything actually occurred. So by its very nature, it's very easy to ignore those on construction sites. However, I've talked to so many different safety professionals and we've all come to the common consensus that by failure to investigate near misses, you're actually losing out on the opportunities to prevent something from happening in the near future. Why do people not report near misses? Well, many workers fear retaliation and certainly that's, a, that's an issue that has to be dealt with on a cultural level, which is not the topic of our discussion today, but is something that we will get into. Um, or they simply don't have faith that if they report any near misses, that management is going to do anything about them. And that, again, is a cultural issue that has to be overcome. And that's something that we'll also focus on in the near future. So let's take a look at a couple of safety models. These are highly disputed, but the premise behind it is that you're gonna have X number of near misses before you have a minor injury, before you have a major injury. And I'm not gonna go into a history lesson. This first came about with Heinrich, and this is Heinrich's famous 329-1 mode model that he used um, to try to explain how many near misses. Highly debated, and this is also challenged by many safety professionals. But the premise does exist, and uh, most safety professionals that you talk to today do believe that a significant number of near misses will occur before an actual injury does occur. And in investigating many, many near misses, even within our own or organization, we see that how these near misses could have easily led to an incident. And going back in history, how they have probably led to incidents that we've had in the past. Uh, next slide. The next slide is Bird's safety triangle. Um, his is slightly different in terms of how he has his structured, um, but nonetheless, the premise is roughly the same. Whether or not you agree with Bird's safety triangle or Heinrich's or neither one of these models, um, again, the, the importance behind it is that there usually are early warning indicators that something is amiss. And if we don't find the root cause on why those near misses are happening, then eventually something will happen in terms. So we don't wanna lose these opportunities by not investigating our near misses. Those are extremely important to do so. So now I'm going to turn this over to Larry and Larry's going to take us through um, some unfortunate situations that he's recently been involved in and how with some slight modifications in the overall safety and health program, they could have been prevented using some leading indicators in the, in the future, which is what we want to give you as a takeaway today. Larry, I'm gonna to turn this over to you and, and I know you have some experience and, and dealing with unfortunately some fatalities. Yeah, thank, thank you, Debbie. Uh, hello, old friends. How are you? A bunch of people I've seen here that I uh, haven't seen in years and years and years. Uh, so welcome. Uh, I've been asked to come and share with you some of the fatalities, what occurred and how it, it could have been prevented in retrospect and looking back. And before I, I get started, I downloaded uh, a uh, general near miss policy. Uh, if anybody wants it, I'm gonna hand it over to Carlos. He'll scan it and eventually he will send it off to everybody, uh, whoever requests it. Uh, question for you, how would you like to handle questions today? Do you want folks to ask you as you're going or would you like to reserve questions till the end? Uh, how would you like to handle the questions? Uh, as they come up, let's ask them because usually people forget them by the time you, you get done. So if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, over a period of uh, 34 years, of doing what I'm doing now. I actually started in 1988. Uh, prior to, just to give you a little background, uh, I worked law enforcement. I was hurt on the job. I retired out. And for many years, I worked uh, traffic homicide 
uh, for numerous years prior to me leaving. So accident investigation has kind of been in my blood for a bunch of years. Uh, but when I hear about accident investigation, about the accidents and how we could have prevented them, uh, probably over the last 34 years, I have probably handled somewhere plus or minus, probably on the plus side of 50 fatalities, uh, both when I was working for individual companies and in the last uh, 14 years uh, as the owner of safety consultant and training. And I wanna bring one accident up. Actually, I have two that I wanna to discuss today, take up the time. Uh, one happened about a year and a half, two years ago. It was on a, on a, uh, a school. There was an individual happened to be a superintendent up on a uh, roof uh, doing an inspection of work that was going to occur in the future, had not started yet. Uh, let me preface all this by saying for the, I go out on these job sites typically once to twice a month. This one particular job site, I was on it once a month to do an OSHA inspection for the client. Uh, previously, we had written up the fact that the ladders weren't secured. They didn't extend above the roof line where they were supposed to. Uh, they weren't secured at the top nor the bottom. We got with the superintendent. We explained it to him. We brought the roofers down. We explained it to them, went through the process, overdone, it was written up. I get a call one day that the superintendent had there was a 25 inch parapet. The individual stepped on top of the parapet to grab the ladder to come down a 19 foot wall. It wasn't secured. The bottom of the ladder kicked out. When he grabbed it, he misfooted on the six inch wide or eight inch wide parapet. Down he came head first. He died in surgery uh, when they were trying to relieve pressure from the brain. With that being said, when I investigate an accident or I investigate a near miss, and this is not an accident investigation course, but I write down the same six questions I've been doing for the last 34 years. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. And I start working the accident backwards as to what actually occurred after the initial information, the witnesses, the name, paramedics, get all that basic information. Then we start working the accident backwards. And so remember an accident investigation is not to find fault, but to stop further instances. The same thing and the same way that we want to investigate a near miss. This was a near miss months prior because I did get a roofer coming down, ladder was loose and we got them down, secured the ladder and so on and so forth. I'm gonna turn this over to the panel. Well, I am the panel, I guess. I'm gonna turn it over to the folks in the audience as to what could have been done in this case to prevent this fatality. Anybody want to chip in? The ladder could have been secured. All right, you're, you're correct. That's what we did the month before and we secured the ladder. It wouldn't have kicked out. You probably wouldn't have misfooted. it. Oh, I forgot to mention another thing. We also wrote up the fact that there was no step up on the inside of the parapet because it was a 25 inch from the roof to the top of the parapet and not to get into OSHA regulations, but everybody I think here should know that anytime you have a change in elevation of 19 inches or more, you must provide a stairway ladder ramp or something to get from point A to point B. That was not done either, all right? So the ladder could have been secured. Another thing that could have been done was what? Anybody? The, the staff up the access. All right, let's take it back. Here we go. Now we're going to start investigating the a near miss. Let's say a fatality didn't occur. Let's just take it back as a near miss. What could have been done prior to that? Let's talk about supervision, following the right rules and regulations. I'll call you back. My brother lives in Vegas and that was him and he thinks I'm awake. <laughs> uh, let's take it back a little further. Let's talk about the near miss and what could have been done. Let's say it wasn't a fatality. It wasn't an accident. What could we have done? Or what could the supervisor have done in order to avoid it? Where would it start? What's the root cause of this? Uh, 
I'm sorry? Assessing the error for proper uh, access. By who? By the supervisor. And you were saying? This is where it starts to go back. And I find this over and over and over again. It's supervision. I wrote down some notes and I'm, I'm gonna kind of put them aside because it, it all boils down to the same thing. If you've been in this business for any period of time, it's blow and go. A great gentleman, whether you're doing drywall and framing. Gonzalo, how many times have you seen what I'm saying? It's blow and go. People either think it's normal or superintendents think it's normal because they see it every day and they don't make the correction. Had the superintendent in this case made the correction, it probably, can't say it wouldn't have, but probably wouldn't have occurred. Are we in agreement? Let's take it back even further. Let's get back to the root cause. When I started looking at the training that the superintendent had, what did I find as far as ladder training? Just a little bit between zero and a little bit less than S. Right. Finding it all the time where people are being sent out, whatever level they may be, without the proper training, without the proper starting light, pretty much. Right. So that's what I found in this one. When I got back to it, training wasn't there. Superintendent didn't follow the previous reports, and it could have saved his life. All right. Larry, I have a question. Larry, I have a Go question ahead. for you. So how do, how was that addressed by the company with the supervisor who failed to correct it once he knew that this was already a hazard that had been previously corrected? And then, of course, when the ladder, I guess, was moved or whatever, it was never put in proper position and tied off and secured. It, this is an easy one, Debbie. It was a supervisor that fell and died himself oh my goodness okay it, it was a superintendent uh like i said he came down head first um he, he wasn't found initially but somebody from the school saw a hard hat laying in the middle of the vestibule and couldn't figure out why it was there for so long went down looked at it and found him uh, behind the truck they couldn't see oh him my goodness inside. but it was a superintendent that um that passed all right i'm gonna bring you up to another one and I can go on and on all the fatalities, but I want to bring it all in. It happened to, uh, I guess, about three or four weeks ago. I had an individual, and I'm only going to tell you he's Hispanic because English was not his first language, nor did he speak other than maybe a couple of words, yes, no, maybe. Had been in this country for two and a half weeks. Uh, was working, shaking out steel on the top of a... Uh, warehouse there was an opening left for what i believe and i'll tell you why i'm saying why i believe because we couldn't get straight answers uh in the roof and i believe they're using that for access with a scissor lift onto the decking uh he fell 38 feet pretty much head first and, and also when his feet got hung up what apparently on the uh the decking and came down and uh, you, you know the rest of the story uh, let's talk about this one and back this one up to find out how this could have been prevented and avoided. Now, I know this is not a near miss, but it's actually investigated the same way. When I went up onto the area, I've no monitoring system, no warning line system, no fall protection, no anchor points, nothing. Zero. When we started working it backwards, like we did with the other one, and we do with every one of them, we get back to first thing, was there any supervisors on the roof with them? The answer was no. It was a, it was a, we come to find out also, eventually it was a sub of a sub of a sub that the GC didn't know was on the job site. Was the, it, I'm not going to get into tax investigation. I promise myself I wouldn't. All right. But let's work it back. Here's a company who's putting people out on the job. And when I started working it back, just like I do with the last one, what, what I find a lack of training. 
Matter of fact, I couldn't even get this guy. Nobody knew the guy's name when I was on the job site. Near misses, accidents. The near miss, the injury doesn't occur. The accident could lead up to fatality. I was asked to speak about fatalities today. So let's get back to the near misses again. Who, what, when, where, why, and how, and we start working it backwards. And it's inevitable. So I'm coming back to lack of training, lack of supervision, lack of people because it's blow and go to get the work done and hurry up. We are basically working on luck. And I like to say to people, it doesn't become a priority until it what becomes a priority. And that's when the attorneys have to get involved and start sorting things out seriously and start sorting things out. In this particular case, sub of a sub of a sub, nobody wanted to take claim to who the employer was. So it starts working its way back up. Larry, um, I might yes, want to add training is an is another leading indicator too. So the I'm amount sorry? of training that's done, training and the participation rate as well as the pass rate is another important leading indicator that can be used because that also, and I'm, I'm a firm believer that basically you can't even discipline people until you've trained them. So you have to start with the training first. And then if they're not adhering to the training, then you can start using the, the progressive discipline. But training is an important leading indicator. So that's another leading indicator that was missed in that particular scenario. Debbie's 100% right. When we start looking at these things, and now with the hiring shortages and, and so on and so forth, very few people are out there that are actually trained in what they're supposed to be doing. Debbie's 100% right, but it's got to start on the job site when the superintendent for the GC sees somebody coming onto the job site to ask the right questions, to get the right paperwork, to get the right certifications for the people that are doing the job. We had to get back to the root cause. And many, many, many times that supervision kind of turns a blind eye in order to get the job done. I'm seeing a lot of heads going, yeah, it, it, it's, it's fact. That's absolutely fact. So. This has been the story since I've been doing this 34 years ago. You know, production, there is a way to take production and take safety, combine them and have them work hand in hand. I, I was shocked. I'm getting a little bit off the subject here and you know, Carlos has got the, the half smile on. Uh, it, you know, I, I got this. I have sat down with many owners of companies many owners of companies, both big and small. And one of the questions that I asked them is something called an EMR. Anybody has an idea what an EMR is? You would be shocked. Ladies and gentlemen, you would be shocked. No idea, right? To, to know that these people who pay the bills have no idea what an experience modification rating is. It's a percentage that your workers' comp is based on. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you do know that everybody in this room has the same workers' comp as statutory. And, but how you pay for it can make you or break you. And your injury rate, your injury, I'll, I'll explain it to you one day. And I won't send you a bill, I promise. Uh, By it, the it, way, let's make clear that that is not a safety professional. <laughs> that he is pointing at. Yeah, I'm pointing at an attorney. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, seriously, that it, it's an indic it, it's a percentage that your workers comp is based on, um, depending on it's an experience modification rating. Uh, you'd be shocked that they don't realize it until it hits the fan, and all of a sudden their EMR shoots up, and now the workers comp is fifty percent, seventy percent, eighty percent more than it was last year, and then it becomes a priority. 
So I, I learned a long time ago, there was a gentleman that I dealt with, he was a CFO. And he brought me into his office one day. So I want to show you something. And they had a very, very strong safety program. And he opened up some books and he showed me several million dollars on the books. It was on paper, but they had saved in the workers' comp cost because of the safety program they had. And he's the one that taught me many years ago that safety actually can become a profit center. Big profit. Huh? Big profit. Big profit center. So when you, and, and getting back to the near misses, I don't want to get too far off the subject, but if you can investigate these things, if you can prevent them from happening, if you can keep your experience modification low and, and do the job that we're supposed to do as a safety professional and try to convince the people in the ivory tower, I'll probably get kicked out of here, uh, in the ivory tower, uh, how important it is that we can make a difference. We really can make a difference. So, yes, Larry, I, I wanted to ask a question here so that we can have a, a brief discussion with the group here too. But in your experience and in, in investigating so many different types of fatalities, what would you say are some of the common indicators that had they been caught previously um, would have prevented these fatalities? What's the most common indicators that you've found amongst these? Okay, good question. And I have an answer for it. I would uh, hope it so. To, it, it comes back to supervision. When supervision sees workers coming on the job site to perform a task, and they haven't got the right equipment, they haven't got the right PPE, that should be the indicator that there's a problem. When you've got folks coming on the job, and doesn't have to pick out any one particular trade, but to do roofing, and here in Florida, everything's low slope, less than four and 12, and they don't have the proper means and methods to set up a warning line system. There's no documentation for fall protection, that's a leading indicator. When you have drywall companies with all the respect guys and they don't provide a short ladder for these guys to use and they're on five gallon buckets. It, it's, it's, am I right or wrong? All right, I, I'm, 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 I'm dead on with this. They provide five gallon buckets for the guys to stand on. You talk about near misses, I can't tell you how many people I've seen fall off these buckets and not break an ankle or not break a wrist. I actually saw a guy, believe it or not, and this is kind of a little bit of a joke, he took his shoes off, he screwed them to two five-gallon buckets, and that was his stilts. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, <laughs> it worked. But the but leading indicators, it starts with supervision, seeing subcontractors, in most cases, coming on the job without the right equipment to do the job properly, that they have to fudge the work. You had people coming on the job to do, let's say, overhead um, uh, life safety, and they don't have safety glasses, although they're using PVC glue and PVC cleaner overhead. In the last three weeks, I've had four people fall from ladders and get seriously hurt. None of them had the proper training. Two of them had broken ladders. Leading indicators. Look at you people as they come on the job and see if they have the right equipment, the right PPE, the right tools to do the job. That's where it starts. You know, it's like going fishing. All of a sudden, you invite somebody fishing, they bring a new rod, a new reel, a new tackle, something scary. <laughs> you know what I mean? Look like yeah. fun in the video. Huh? Look like fun in the video. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but you understand what I'm saying? Leading indicator. It's what you see. Well, one thing I wanted to add to this um, also do. is is how to get people to report near misses, and it's not easy. I, I won't I won't uh, mislead anyone. It, it it is a cultural change that has to be affected. Um, so one of the things that that we did that was very effective in getting near miss reports is we created safety committees on on each of our project sites. And when you have the safety committees on the project sites, the safety committees, then when that's easier to kind of educate that group and they can be the eyes and the ears out there and then they report back with different near misses. And you have to, of course, make sure that they understand the importance.
of reporting these and the value and that they're not going to suffer any adverse consequences, just the opposite, that we recognize them for that. And we call them like safety stars and things like that for doing, um, for helping us out with that. But our safety committees are very important on the site safety uh, projects because of the fact that they really do, they are your eyes and ears. And the guys know, they know, they'll tell you, oh yes, this almost happened, this happened here. You know, but somebody was eating lunch and a piece of plywood fell off the building, but he didn't get hurt. You know, so they they tell you about things that are happening that can easily lead to serious injuries and fatalities. So that is one way to, to get that process started, because I know for a lot of folks there, it, sound, it sounds very. Um, and when I first started working with near misses, it sounds easier than it actually is to get that information. And I've heard from my own safety team many times, too. I can't get them to report near misses. Well, this is how you have to do it with them. You have to make them understand. You have to educate them. And you have to honestly reward them. And reward doesn't necessarily mean a monetary reward. Um, many times it's just really thanking them for, for helping and assisting. And we buy all of our safety committee lunches. So they, they, they know that they're appreciated at being part of the safety committee. So there's little things like that that you can do to help kickstart a near miss program. And Larry mentioned he does have a near miss program there that is available for anyone that's participating today and that might be also something that um, you can use Larry. Now, Larry, I'm not trying to volunteer your services, but you can use Larry to, to help you get your near-miss program kicked off. And by the way, my phone number, don't no, give me. Thank you for your services. They said one thing, one thing because we spoke about it yesterday preparing for today, but you didn't mention it explicitly. Who is it that are on these safety committees on your job sites? No, that's a great point. So our safety committees on our job sites are comprised with the, the laborers, the carpenters. Um, we have very little supervision in those meetings. And with, this, with the sole purpose of this is a conversation about safety and we want to hear from the, from the guys. And so to avoid any type of um, how, you know, even unforeseen uh, issues like, oh, well, there's a concrete pour that's going to be coming in or the loads coming in or, you know, that they feel that the, the supervisor is going to pull them away with being in that meeting because the supervisor's radios never stop. Their phones never stop. Um, they, they can dedicate their time to really discussing the safety issues. And we let them know. And every meeting we follow back up with our safety committees and we tell these guys, OK, so you brought to our attention A, B, C, D and E. You told us about this problem. You told us about a problem with the subcontractors on the site doing this, that were creating hazards to our people. This is what we have done to correct this. So we want them to know that we're definitely following up on those issues. But yeah, it's, it's, it's the guys that are actually doing the work. One of the, one of the issues that comes up with a lot of companies is that they're too small to have a safety committee. But it's the truth. They're, 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 four and five and six and seven people companies, too small. Uh, this is where the consortiums come in and you can put several companies together to create one, take an individual from each company and create a consortium for people within the industry. Seems to work as well. If you're not as big as Current or Stiles or, or, or Thornton or Miller or one of the larger companies. Uh, it's very, very difficult. I'm going to close with this. Uh, you mentioned before, you do, you get promoted. You do, you get promoted. You, know, you blow and go, you get promoted. Every GC out there, every subcontractor, subcontractor out there, they, their, their scale is based on what happens, what production is. As safety people, we're based on what doesn't happen. And, it, and it's hard for people to fathom that and oh, everything's going smooth. There's a reason behind it. You know, so where well, we're based on what doesn't happen, those folks are based on what does happen, and that's why it's blow and go. And it's very, very difficult to get them to stop and do it. Incentivizing is, is phenomenal, but not every company is big enough to do that. So unless there's no further questions, I've got it. Yes, sir. So do you have any comment or on your experience or, or some pointers with regards to I have found out that 
not only cell phones, Dan, uh, I got to add to that headsets and music uh, on the job becomes very distracting. Uh, you can't hear the, the, a lot of the warning signs around you of things that may occur. So not only cell phones, I, I don't believe they should be able to be used on a job site. Uh, I think they should be, I don't can't say outlawed because you need them in case of emergencies. Uh, but radios, headsets, and other outside noises, I think should be tempered in some way, shape, or form. It uh, has a point. I, I'm finding out that many times now. Yeah, well, that's why I'm making sure mine goes off. <laughs> it's going to ring again. Uh, that I'm amazed because now instead of getting blueprints, they're on iPads, they're on their phone, and everything is right there for them. It's saving the paper, the time, it's boom. So they can't ban the phones, but the music, the radios, that needs to be tempered. You know, I don't know who, who the monitoring, once again, I keep falling back on supervision, if that's what you're asking. Yeah, it, it's, 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 it, it goes back to looking for root causes. That's where it starts, as far as I'm concerned, is the initial training before somebody gets put on a job. Yeah, I, I go into one of my clients uh, shows a video in English and in Spanish before any worker is allowed to go on the job. That's great if they're paying attention. But I walked in the other day to an orientation, four out of the six guys in there going, and it's playing. And then and they're not paying attention to it. So there's nobody there monitoring it. Yeah, same thing. <laughs> same thing, same thing. So if there's nothing further, I'm going to turn it back over to Carlos and uh, thank you for hiring me. Yes, sir. One of the things that I've done recently is that using not only the, the amount of the amount of the citation, but 25 years in prison, I've gotten a little bit more, I guess, shred now that they're paying attention. And uh, two cases. I'm sorry, Fernando, you spent 25 years in prison? <laughs> <laughs> So that explains a lot, actually. <laughs> gotcha. Uh, um, but um, that has helped with some of these supervisors that are, I should say, lawyers, um, because there's two cases. The superintendents, who's the superintendent here? Want to appear? They were brought in on a civil suit. And luckily, they had done their due diligence by the paperwork on Washington. And they were kind of slew, but they were dragged in personally on the civil suit. Remember, we're in Florida. I don't like you, I can sue you. Right, Mr. Attorney? Well, not that I don't think, but <laughs> no, I, I understand what you're saying. Uh, the, the, it, just, <laughs> I, I'm gonna close with this just since Fernando brought it up. Um, in January, the minimum OSHA fine now for a serious or an other than serious is $14,502 and for willful or repeat it's $145,200 so just be aware that they're trying to get some teeth in it but that's not the subject of today so thank you all for having me oh thank you thank you larry yeah absolutely thank you larry so Thank you all very much to those of you who joined us online. It's great having you here. Of course, the attorney's the one making noise over here, of course. Hey, I want to say thank you to all of our partners that allow us to bring this uh, presentation to you. I want to thank the team at Kelly Cronenberg. I want to thank the team at Safe Right Solutions, our title sponsor, Milwaukee, and most of all, our host here at Styles Construction. Thank you very much to Ian and his team for having us. Hey, fishing, July 22nd through 24th. It is gonna be one hell of a party. It's a great time and it's a family event. So if you wanna make a weekend out of it, bring your kids, bring your wife, have a great time um, and join us at Bado Blanco Resort, July 22nd through 24th. That being said, have a fantastic day. Stay safe out there. Thank you.